Hello and welcome to the Andwise podcast. We are delighted to have you here spending some time with us. Andwise is a technology platform that aims to empower medical students, trainees and early career physicians to navigate the complex financial journey that we all find ourselves on as we aim to help others. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Welcome to the Handwise podcast. Um, we have been very fortunate to have a medical advisory board this past year, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kida Duroan. She has been one of our medical advisory board members. She's a family medicine physician. She's triple board certified. She's a digital healthcare leader, fractional CMO. She's got her own podcast. She's doing a lot of stuff, and we're so delighted to have her. Thanks for joining, Dr. Duroan. Thank you for having me. I usually let guests introduce themselves because a third party can never do any justice. So what is your introduction when you're introducing yourself to other people? Sure. So I'm Arkita DeRowan. I'm originally from the DC metro area. I grew up as an only child. I've been involved and in, wanted to get into medicine. One of those kind of boring stories. I have pictures when I was three at Christmas, like with the little doctor kit, but I ended up going to college in Virginia at Hampton University, go Pirates. And then I ended up doing an early medical school selection program where I did like some summers in my senior year at Boston University and then transitioned there into their medical school. Then I definitely had a love for primary care and things throughout life, but it solidified when I got into medical school and I decided to go into family medicine. I thought I would be doing this for 30 years until I retired in my community doing underserved medicine. So I ended up doing the National Health Service Corps program where after residency, you'll work at a federally qualified health center. After I did my family medicine residency at University of Maryland, I started working in the outskirts of Baltimore. Um, And it was a wonderful experience where you had so many patients, 50% of my patients were undocumented, uninsured. I had worked at an LGBT clinic. So there was a lot of different variety in the types of medicine that I was doing, including HIV care and all of those things. But there was also the dynamics of administration and being able to know what to do for patients medically, but not necessarily knowing what to do for them when they couldn't afford something. So It became that kind of internal struggle with me. And then on top of that, I decided to unionize. I was voluntold to lead those efforts as the physician rep for five centers. So with that, I learned a lot about administration and organization and things. I figured out that I had a passion for that. I decided to transition into telehealth before it was cool um, back in about 2017, 2018. And started to grow in leadership there at one of the organizations I was in. And from there, I've started to transition and I fully transition now into digital health consulting where I help organizations kind of decrease risk and operational costs caused by like clinical errors and other things that aren't in compliance and in the regulatory guidelines to keep patients safe. That's awesome. Your digital health work, yeah, telehealth, sorry, you mentioned you have many state licenses, right? I think I have six or seven, but you have dozens, right? <laughs> So I used to have 51, but I I just went to uh, go and pause. So I have 48 states in D.C. That's amazing. There's something I learned of a couple of years ago called the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. It's like in 37 states. Do you have that or did you apply for all of these individually? I have. That's amazing. I know there's some criteria to get that. I live in New Jersey, and I think you have to either live or have worked in one of the states to qualify for that. And I can't do it, but that's amazing that you were able to do it. Just since we're uh, trying to help everyone with their financial wellness, is there a particular software or system you use to track all of the requirements for keeping on top of 40-something licenses? We could talk for a whole podcast on that. It is work for those who are interested in it, but I think that it definitely allows you to have more freedom in terms of where you can practice and how you practice. I did use the interstate um, medical licensure, IMLLC. You have to, like you said, work at least 50% primarily in one of the states where it's offered or live in one of those states. 
you have to have that state as your main one and you go through the program with that. But to answer your question, there are a lot of different platforms. There are some that are popping up. There are some that actually have people do your licensing for you and all of those kinds of things. And I will say that Modio has been a really lifesaver for me because you can store everything. It's secure. It has your passwords. It has when your licenses expire. You can put all of your information that you can then resubmit to different licensing bodies because every licensing body has different rules. Another thing in order to keep up with all of the CME that you will be needing, I would use NetCE. They have one where you can buy a package for three or $400 and you can, it tells you what each state requires and how you can mesh them together. And then there's another one that is required that is skipping my mind right now, but it is affiliated with like NetCE where there are about five or six states that require that you get some CME from them. That's awesome. Thanks for all that information. So you've, like me, you've moved around a lot during your college, then medical school, and then on to residency and afterwards. When you were a medical student, Boston's like a high cost of living area, right? Did your medical school provide any sort of student subsidized housing or was that on you just to find private apartments or houses or Cautionary tale for the students and residents out there. I made all the mistakes in hindsight. And I won't say they're mistakes, they're life lessons. And who knows how I would have performed if I had lived in different environments. Boston is really high and BU did not give any extra money for that. So I took out extra loans to live by myself in an apartment in Boston. <laughs> so it was very expensive every month and I went into my loan burden. Yeah, I, I hear that. And when I was a medical student and resident, I, th I thought it was important to live by myself, or particularly as a resident, because you're, you're just so tired in your hours that you have off. I, I, I didn't want to deal with any roommate drama and everyone has different study schedules and lifestyles. And um, yeah, but, you, but you're right. When, you, when you're a student, your focus is on study and sometimes the financial numbers in our minds the same thing happened to me my, when I was a resident at, at New York University in internal medicine. I had this fifth floor walk-up apartment, but it was 50% of my post-tax paycheck. So we would get paid every two weeks. And basically one paycheck out of the two every month would go towards my rent. So definitely uh, added to my debt. Since And then how about residency in Maryland? Did you was That must have been a little less cost of living, right, versus Boston or not really? Honestly, it kind of like now, I think there's a larger gap. I recently went to Boston for a reunion and I talked with a lot of students and I think the rent I was paying when I was in residency had definitely doubled. They do have some kind of lottery where some of the students can get some housing that is subsidized now. But I think when I was transitioning from Boston to Baltimore, I think it may have been a $200 difference or something like that. So it wasn't that large, but it was still me deciding again to, to live in another apartment by myself, despite knowing several people in the program. And then the next year, one of my best friends, actually, she's going to hate me for saying this on the podcast, but she actually ended up coming to our residency the next year. And she asked like, where should I live? Could we live together? And I was like, no. <laughs> so she actually lived down the hall from me. We both pay for one bit for one apartment. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's nice to have some distance from even your best friends and yes. family. My, my mom always said, live close enough to visit, but far enough to go sleep home at the end of the night. So um, I, I always talk to guests about like my own journey about, you know, a student loan burden. When I was coming out, I graduated med school in 2008 and I had like about $160,000 worth of debt. Now I look at the younger graduates, people in the generation before below me, or, or like 10, 15 years below me, and the debts are up to two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000. And I, one of the mistakes I always talk about is I treated it like monopoly money. I always thought that physicians are high income paid professionals, even the quote unquote lowest paid ones still earn three to four times what average Americans earn. So I never had any budgeting system. I always just made sure I wasn't getting myself into credit card debt, making sure I didn't develop a shopping addiction and didn't get too comfortable with eating out at nice places or wearing nice things. But 
besides that, I didn't really have a system. Did you ever use any like spreadsheets or any apps? Like I know the personal finance apps like Mint or Personal Capital, which is now Empower or some people use uh, YNAB, which is you need a budget. Did you ever use anything from what you remember or do you use anything now or? To be honest, I've tried two of those. I've tried Mint and YBAD. I will say that my situation was like my family is not financially savvy and I, I had absolutely no idea when I was choosing schools, when I was going through and just being transparent, I chose two private institutions. So my undergrad was private and my medical school, so it was very expensive. I did not have a full ride to undergrad. So I went into medical school with that. And I'm so thankful that I knew my family and still not getting the credit card debt and all of those kinds of things because living in Boston, Newberry Street was a lovely experience to go to after test. I just didn't buy anything. <laughs> I was a Marshalls and TJ Maxx girl. But I will say that when I left medical school, I was in the low 380s, probably close to four. And I did not know how to handle it. I did not. Um, have any plans. So I explored some of those apps, but I wasn't very diligent with it and put things off. So, okay, I'll wait till I'm attending to figure it out. So I, I would definitely tell anyone like who's entering this phase to have a plan, go through it. If you don't understand it, you should always understand what you're doing, what you're paying for. Read. The information is out there, especially with organizations popping up like NYs that are helping you navigate these things. Talk to other people. I think that a lot of times, even discussing with my friends now, as opposed to when we were first getting in residency and stuff, I know there was some program, I forgot what it was, but a couple of my friends signed up for it our intern year, and I ended up signing for, up for it, I think, my third year. But I was like, no one told me. And they're like, oh, we thought you knew. So just discuss things and talk about it amongst yourselves. Yeah, I it was like completely not on my radar about the public service loan forgiveness. What I ended up doing after residency, I probably wouldn't have qualified anyway because I worked part-time and lived in Haiti and Nepal. But if it had been on my radar, maybe I could figure out a schedule where I could have done both. The other thing I think I did a little late was I, I didn't consolidate my loans until a few years into becoming an attending. So I had some loans at 2% and some loans at 6.8%. And again, not having any student loan strategy, it took me years before I figured out, wait a minute, there's companies like SoFi or Laurel Road that at that time when I did consolidate, the, the rates were like 3%. So it definitely helped me save some interest for a number of years. And since you've been a family medicine attending, you've been doing a lot of awesome non-clinical stuff. Um, one of the things that sticks out for me is your TEDx talk. How did that come about? Were you just going about your day-to-day -day things and it was an opportunity that was presented to you or were you always interested in giving a TEDx talk? Like how, how does one, I'm always impressed when people are, are willing to put themselves out there, get on the stage and uh, in front of a bunch of people and deliver a talk. So. It was an experience. I will say that I've always been a fan of TED Talks. I watch them and find them inspirational or learn something. And I think it was on my bucket list, like, oh, maybe one day in 10 years or so, I'll do one. And then I think the pandemic hit and I think a lot of people became more reflective and they started to look into things that they were interested in. I've always been into sitting on panels, public speaking and those types of things, but I started to speak more often and at different institutions and things. I also started to do my podcast and all of those kinds of stuff. I had put it on my little list in 2020, like maybe next year I'll do one and things like that. During some of one of the physician groups I was in, they mentioned TEDx group. I ended up joining the group and just learning like how the system works and how you submit your applications and what idea you're getting across. Because I think a lot of times when we do medical lectures or different types of talks, you want to get away your key objectives or your key points and all of those kinds of things. But usually for TEDx, it's one idea submitted some applications and I was accepted, but I did not realize how much work it is in the TEDx. You're given a coach, you have to meet with them weekly, they go over your stuff, they give you tips, they tell you how to 
understand how to emphasize certain words. It was a lot of training. And I think that it was really good. It was a great experience. And I recommend that anyone that has a specific idea to share it. For me personally, we haven't talked much about it, but I'm very passionate about health equity. I think that at the cornerstone of anything in healthcare, if we could have more equitable systems in place, it could not only improve patient lives and outcomes, but it also can improve efficiencies and costs because a lot of the costs and things are due to these delay care, the inadequate care, all of those kinds of things, the malpractice. I think that everyone should deserve a right to great quality health care. So with that, my um, talk was called Did Disney Just Save Healthcare? Imagine that. And it talked about the Disney Imagineering process in which they bring people from all walks of life to come together to solve problems in Disney outside of the movies. And I talked about how we could utilize that and implement it in digital health because I think in digital health, we work in silos. We have physicians or clinicians, all of the different teammates in healthcare. And then we have the engineers and product development team, and they're just trying to fix this problem and going back and forth instead of coming together with a common language. I talk about how we can bring people from all walks of life to come together to make more equitable systems. And out of that, I um, developed the pacemakers, which is working to help patients navigate this complex system through education, resources, and community building. And I think with that, if hospitals adopt it, if they have a little social worker in their pocket through, it can help patients as well improve these outcomes for them. Yeah, that's fantastic. You do so much stuff, it's hard to keep track of. You're, you have an excellent website. It's Dr. Erkeda, right? E-R-K-E-D-A dot com. And a, a lot of uh, the, the listeners can find all of your links through that. That's amazing that you started the Pacemakers. Are you trying to reach patients directly to give them their educational resources and empowering them? Or are you going through some sort of patient groups or community groups? What's your plan to reach them through this organization? So we are growing patients directly and organically through the Pacemakers app, but there's also an option for hospital systems and community systems to make their own app out of it using some of these concepts and partnering with the pacemakers. And then you recently became like the, is it the CMO or the CEO or of Emma, right? Uh, Emma. Well, Emmy. So Emmy, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. an officer at Emmy. It's a women's focused digital health organization that's working to prioritize kind of medication reconciliation and remembering birth control and, and all of those kinds of things because it's so important. And I think that women are honestly the cornerstone of healthcare. I hate to say it, but we are in terms, I tell my patients when I do see them that usually when a man comes to the office, it's one of four reasons. Number one, their wife or their mother or their girlfriend told them to come. Number two, school or work told them to come. Number three, they're really in pain and they think they're dying. Or number four, they think they have an STD. So those are usually about 90% of the reasons men come to the doctor. So women are pushing that. So they have to prioritize themselves in order to help everyone else around them. Yeah, that's fantastic. A lot of your work clearly ties together with empowering patients. After you finished residency, did you figure out a lot of the nuts and bolts and the processes yourself? Or did you hire professionals like lawyers? CPAs, accountants, or and or like a wealth manager, financial advisor, because physicians are all over the spectrum. There's people in the do-it-yourself camp. There's people that outsource everything. And then unfortunately, there's a third group that just wishful thinks that it will sort itself out, but it doesn't. You have to pick one camp, I think. I think it started with the wishful. And then yeah. I am definitely not a do-it-yourself kind of girl in terms of some of the foundational financial planning. I started with our family CPA. And I think things started to grow and, and get more complex, especially with the 49 licenses and all of those kinds of things. I decided to go to a larger firm and group and, and, and meet with them and have plans and, and talking through what my financial plan would be for the next year and how to set myself up and how to save for retirement and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I did a similar thing when I 
finally finished residency, I had the accountant my dad was using and they were great, but they were like old school meet once a year. He would be penciling stuff down, literally writing it down with a pencil. And it felt chaotic, like just doing it last minute in March before tax returns were due. And now, yeah, after I've gotten married, gotten a little older, we, we have our own accountant and we email during the year. We send documents during the year. I, I also didn't realize when I finished residency, like the different ways you can get paid. Like a lot of physicians are employees and they get a form called a W-2 and during their paycheck, uh, taxes are taken out. Maybe their benefit pay is taken out. But then you can also do independent contractor work and you get a form called a 1099. But I didn't realize, I guess I did realize, but I didn't budget very well that the taxes are on you to pay to the government. And, and that takes an incredible amount of organization. With all of the different things that you're doing, have you, uh, I'm just assuming, and if you feel comfortable sharing, have you had to set up different LLCs or corporations or professional um, service corporations to do your different work or you're just paid directly to your name? Yes. So I do mostly do 1099 work. Now I only do 1099 work. I transitioned this year from W2. And I had originally set up an LLC when I started doing public speaking and all of those kinds of things in the beginning of the pandemic. And as things have evolved, having different corporations for different things, LLCs, and now looking at transitioning. So this year I, I did get an S Corp. There are certain rules I will mention to those who are thinking about multi site licensure or wanting to actually practice medicine more intensely at to be honest, at this time, I am transitioning from one-on-one -on -one healthcare. I see about two patients a week um, for a telehealth company now, but I'll say two hours a week, not necessarily two patients. But what I will say is there are certain rules for the types of LLC you can have, depending on what kind of role you're doing. Certain states have PLLCs and then for certain other organizations, if you're opening your own healthcare organization or you're partnering with a startup or something like that. They have things called, <clears throat> excuse me, PCs with the corporate practice of medicine. And a lot of states, non-physicians can't own corporations that influence the workflows of patients. We have to have physician owners and partnerships and things like that. There, there are many different ways. Look at your state and look and see what their rules and regulations are so that you won't find out in tax time. Yeah. And then setting up any of these things like a limited liability company, uh, LLC or whatever, did you end up doing that yourself, like through something like Rocket Lawyer, or did you just hire an attorney to do that for you? I used the, the easy way <laughs> through one of those organizations. I have uh -huh. been using those. Oh, nice. Great. I think it's more complex, you, you need a lawyer. Yeah. And then also, I think a lot of people need to be aware when you start these companies, every single state has requirements about filling out something similar to called an annual report, where it's a very simple document, but they want their money every year. <laughs> some states are very expensive, like California, and some states are cheaper, like Nevada and Las Vegas. Sorry, Nevada and I blanked on the other one. Wyoming, I think is one of the cheapest states, and Delaware, maybe. And of course, whenever you start something, you, you need to, as a physician, you need to have malpractice insurance. And then you need to have business insurance as well, depending on what type of business you have. So if you're operating in like a physical space, then you need to have general uh, liability insurance and stuff like that. So, so it's a lot of stuff to be organized about, right? Absolutely. That's why I definitely recommend if you are considering entrepreneurship with a medical license that you own or board certification, because when people are looking for you for litigation, they always see that MD or that DO. So definitely protect yourself from those liabilities. I would not recommend winging it. When I mentioned to clarify that I did it myself, I use this, I do have a personal lawyer, a few of them, some friend lawyers, but actually one that I've used for like my contracts and things for a few years. And I've gotten advice from legal representation. So I would not say just go on the internet and, oh, let me just sign up for this. Get some legal advice, unless you're MDJD. 
<laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Being an entrepreneur, the other the, a lot of people, there's a fear about taking the first step because we, a lot of us don't know, like, where will I get my health insurance? What kind of retirement plans are available to us? A lot of people have heard of employer-sponsored 401ks or 403bs. Uh, again, if you feel comfortable sharing, did you set up, because some of the ones I've heard about from people are individual IRAs, you can get self-employed 401ks, solo 401ks, sorry. Did, did, have you set up some of these for yourself or are, are you just saving money just separately outside of sort of in retirement accounts? I, I have been, so I transitioned completely in May. So I have been saving money, but I am with my accountant in January to set up all of those things that we have been researching because you have to pour into yourself. I think a lot of people do get stuck in that employee mindset where if I don't work for someone, how will I get health insurance? How will I save for retirement? It's not for everybody, but I don't think that should be a prohibiting factor because you can do that and it is possible. And there are so many different avenues and things set up where you can definitely make your salary and more by working for yourself and covering those fees. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I transitioned in January from full-time clinical medicine to joining Andwise full-time. And I went on the healthcare exchange for the first time and bought health insurance for myself and three kids because my wife gets hers through work. But it wasn't that much more expensive than what I had been paying my portion through my employer. Yes, it was a couple of hundred dollars more, but it wasn't like catastrophic. Absolutely. Because I was very uh, nervous about that as well, because a lot of people talk about that and they talk about all the other things. And then you see COBRA fees if you transition and you're like, what is this? But the exchange, like when you have a life changing moment, whether or not it's losing a job, there are different reasons that you will qualify outside of open enrollment. And open enrollment is November to, to the end of December, January. And you can go on the exchange and there are so many different plans depending on where your lifestyle is, where it's super affordable in most states. I think a lot of people that I talk to who are interested in transitioning to self-employment, they're always thinking about their health insurance because number one, we're doctors and we see things and health and all of that kind of thing doesn't have an age limit. Oh, let me get some insurance when I'm 50. Get some insurance. But... Definitely um, don't let that hold you back because there are many options out there. And there are even some organizations where there are people who are 1099s or executives or employees who come together and they even get their different plans together. And then there are some other indemnity groups and other startups that are starting up to help with coverage as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we're coming up on time, but I, I like to ask all guests, do you have any off the cuff advice, recommendations, any other life lessons we haven't covered? None, none of the uh, content on the podcast is formal legal accounting advice otherwise. But for instance, one of our guests always talks about the biggest mistake he made was buying whole life insurance and that cost him tens of thousands of dollars. Other physicians often talk about lifestyle creep and how they saw their first big attending paycheck and went out and bought a really expensive luxury car. Is there anything you've seen with your peers or that, that you would just like to pass on to the, the people younger than you or behind in your career journey about what to avoid? Definitely. I'll share three things. Number one, don't get hyper-focused on what the end goal is. A lot of times people will really, I know in the transition from residency to attending hood, hyper focus on what their first job will be. Most people's first job is not their last job. I would say 80% of the time, even probably less now with the way that the world and the healthcare system works. Find a job that is a good fit for you now. The person that you are now may not be the same person that you are 10 years from now. So it's okay to pivot. It's okay to change. It's okay to have different experiences. I mentioned in the beginning that I thought that I would be working in an underserved health clinic for 30 years. That didn't happen. It happened for three. It's okay if you have other interests and it's okay also to express them. I think with me now being a full-time health consultant and impacting world in the digital space through different various arenas of leadership, 
I think originally me as a physician, it was a little difficult for me to transition from seeing patients every day because you feel as though you put all this work, decades of work into seeing patients and that's who you are. Being a doctor should never define who you are. It's a component of who you are and it's giving you some skill sets, but you can use those skill sets to do so many things. As a family physician, a lot of people will say, don't go into family medicine. They don't make that much money and all of those kinds of things, but you can create the career that you want and you have valuable skills. So I would say, think about what you want and not the idea that you think other people have for you. And my final Thing, I guess I will say just in terms of what you were saying about insurance and all of those kind of things, definitely get disability insurance. I would say that there are so many physicians in which they're surgeons or OBGYNs. I think we've had someone, Dr. Pearson, on with Ann Wise, who's talked about her experience where she was an OBGYN and she had shoulder injury, all of those kinds of things, and she was not able to work. So definitely get disability insurance because you're the healthiest that you'll ever be in your entire life right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Arkita Duran. Thanks for your time. And we'll we'll put your website, your LinkedIn in the show notes. Really yeah. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.